Hello and uh, welcome to another lecture in the course. So today we're looking at the open mapping theorem, which is um, section 5.5, a short section in the book. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, the book you can get in the link in the description. All right, so a continuous function, you know, an arbitrary continuous function, you can do all sorts of bad things to your topology. Uh, so, you know, a function from the plane to the plane, right? And it can be actually quite simple. So for example, uh, this map over here, uh, x, y goes to x and x times y, right? Which takes R2, the entire plane, which is open, right? And it takes it to this set, right? Because you notice that if the, if the, the x component in the image is zero, then x was zero. And that means that the y component in the image is zero, right? So uh it goes to this set and that's neither uh neither open nor closed right it's basically that, you know uh r2 um my minus a uh minus a line except one of the points is actually in the set even though it's on the line so it's it's not a it's not an open or closed set it's uh um <clears throat> That's well, it's this weird set. It's actually this map is is a famous map. It's called the blow up map. It's 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 useful in desingularizing thing because it takes it takes uh, straight lines through the origin and sort of spreads them out uh, into uh, horizontal lines, and uh, so that's uh, 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 that's a completely different subject so we're we're gonna ignore that <laughs> so we're we're not interested in that <laughs> at this point we're interested in holomorphic functions this guy is not holomorphic right now holomorphic functions are always nice to your topology now, continuous functions are nice to your topology when pulling backwards so when pulling back uh when you take uh, an open set and you take f inverse of that open set uh that is always open for a whole more uh, for sorry for for a continuous map. Well, also for a holomorphic map. Holomorphic maps are continuous, right? So continuous maps take open sets to open sets in the pullback, uh, which is basically what, what continuous functions are in some sense. Now, holomorphic maps do the same thing forward. Well, they also do it backwards because they're uh, they're continuous, but they also do it forwards. So if you take an open set and you push it forward, then you get an open set. And well, with a small technicality, unless f is constant. If f is constant, then it takes everything to a single point and yeah, uh, then it's not, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> then it's not open, right? So, but except for that special case, um, f of v is always open whenever v is, right? All right, so let's let's just uh, let's just uh, state and prove the theorem. So, start with an uh, a, with a domain, so an open connected subset of the plane, and take a holomorphic function, which is non-constant. So, uh, <clears throat> then for every you know whenever v is an open subset of u, then f of v is an open subset of c, right? So that's the that's the theorem. Right, so, so let's prove this. So suppose that f is non-constant, of course. Uh, then, because u is connected, that means that f is not constant near every point. It cannot be locally constant because if it's locally constant, it would be uh, constant in that whole um, component of u, and u is, uh, uh, u is uh, uh, domain is connected, right? So, holomorphic functions, if they're if they would be locally constant. They're constant everywhere in that same component of the domain, right? Uh, so, well, so in the entire domain, right? If if we're starting with a connected open set, right? So that means that it's 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 locally not constant, right? So suppose we take um, any p in in this v, right? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> now, if we're in, let me draw draw this. Uh, so we have a, a, a P here, right? We have uh, a V here, right? Then there is some small disk around P, right? I'll draw it like this. That's this uh, this disk uh, over here, right? And uh, this, uh, 
this function over here, f of z minus f of p, right? Uh, well, that's zero at p, right? Uh, so that has a zero, right? But it's because f is not constant near p, then it's an isolated zero. So homomorphic functions have isolated zeros. So therefore, if this if this disk over here, if disk over here is small enough, then uh, f of z minus f of p is not zero on this entire circle on the boundary of this of, the, of this disk. So therefore, it's bounded from below. So let delta be the lower bound on on the circle, right? Or some you know some lower bound. You know, strict uh, inequality here. All right. <clears throat> so now this this function f of z minus f of p has at least one zero, right? In in this disk namely at p, right? So take uh, any w in delta ball, this delta over here, right, around f of p, right? Anything in this disk. Uh, now, <clears throat> for every z in the on the circle, right, where we have this estimate, we look at, well, we look at the difference between f of z minus w and f of z minus f of p. We know that this guy has, uh, this guy uh, over here has uh, has a uh, zero, right? We want to know that this guy over here has a zero, right? So we look at their difference. That's just this, uh, which is well, w is in the delta ball around f of p. So uh, yeah, it's less than delta, right? Which is less than f of z minus uh, f of p, right, uh, you know, <laughs> from this estimate, right? So we get that the difference of these two functions, right, is strictly less than this guy on the boundary of this, uh, you know, of, of this little disk on, on this little circle, right? So in other words, those two functions have the same number of zeros, in this little disk, that means that this guy has at least one zero in the disk. Right? Maybe more. Maybe the you know this 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 guy had uh, higher multiplicity zero at, at p. So maybe there's, but it's at least one. At least one. That's that's all 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 we're worried about, right? At this point, meaning there is at least one z in here, such that f of z is equal to w. Well, that means that uh, this entire disk, right, all these Ws are in the image, right, of this little disk. Maybe the image is bigger, but definitely, uh, you know, all of these guys are in there. And that's it, right? That's, that's you know, that's how you show a set is open, right? Uh, uh, you know, that uh, given, uh, we're really looking at F of P, right, given this point, <laughs> right, uh, that you have, so anything, in the image, well, it's it's an image of some p in v, right? So f of p, there's an open set, uh, uh, so open ball, open disk uh, around that point that's in your set, right? So that means that uh, uh, f of v is open, right? Now, <clears throat> the open mapping theorem is basically like a stronger version of the maximum principle. The way to think about it is that, uh, well, you know, unless f is constant, of course, then f p is in the interior of of the uh, of the image, right? So, so if you think of, uh, right, if I, you know, have uh, f of p here, right? Uh, well, the image is uh, is is this uh, you know this whole set over here, right? And so, uh, the modulus cannot obviously attain a maximum at uh, at f of p, right? It has to attain the maximums somewhere, you know. Well, basically, well, <laughs> it attains maximum somewhere on the, you know, on the boundary of things, right? But it's, you know, it it it's, it cannot attain a maximum there, right? So, right. 
so that's the that's the maximum principle from the open mapping principle. So open mapping principle, uh, open mapping term uh, uh, gives the maximum principle, right? Not vice versa. Right? All right. So <clears throat> now one thing to notice from the from the proof, it gives something slightly stronger even. Right, it actually says that uh, it gives you something sort of specific. If you can, if you can find this this little circle, and uh, you get this estimate on this little circle, so you you minimize f z minus f b on the, on that on that circle, uh, you actually get how large of a disk uh, in around f of p is inside the image, right? All right. <clears throat> So, so a couple of exercises. So it's almost not an exercise. It's just a, you know, making sure that you uh, remember what the uh, what the definition of continuous uh, function is in a uh, uh, in a general topological space, right? And so once we have the open mapping term. If you have a holomorphic bijective function, then f inverse, the inverse is actually continuous. Now, it's actually more true, and, and this is something that we will see in the next lecture. Uh, the inverse is actually holomorphic, not just continuous, right? So if you have a bijective holomorphic function, its inverse is going to be not just continuous, but holomorphic. But by the open mapping term, it is at least continuous, right? Uh, a typical application uh, of uh, of the open mapping, oh, maybe not application, but <laughs> this is definitely a typical sort of exam exercise, right? As always, you know, every every exam in uh, in complex analysis uh, uh, has some uh, you know uh, some version of this, right? And here, this is you know, I just made up a random one. So suppose that you have a domain, a holomorphic function. And let's suppose that you have some, uh, you know, some restriction on the image. So in this case, this is basically saying that the image is inside a hyperbola, right? Well, then f is constant. Basically, you know, the point is to recognize that this has no interior, right? All right. So that's it for uh, that's it for uh, today. And so next time we're going to look at uh, you know look at basic at at, at this thing um, at the inverse uh, um, uh, you know you know inverse functions uh, for holomorphic functions. So all right. So see you then.